For the most successful toy franchises, a strong follow-up to an epic opening year is an absolute must. In the case of these transformable robots in disguise, a commercially positive first year meant that the inevitable sophomore campaign had high standards to live up to. The most dominant toy lines of the 1980s also spanned multiple forms of media, giving fans across the globe various options to enjoy their favorite characters. The approach of having toys hanging on pegs at stores, a comic book featuring great writing and illustration, as well as a television series paving the way for an eventual movie, all led to a trifecta approach that companies adopted to ensure that the young male demographic could enjoy seeing their heroes and villains of choice time and time again. As we head into the year of 1985, it's no secret that Optimus Prime and Megatron would benefit from having an expanded cast to fill the Autobot and Decepticon ranks in addition to the already existing broad selection of characters. The previous cast of cars, jets, and mass-shifting handheld items would be flanked by more of the same cars, more of the same jets, and also more of the same handheld items while also increasing the range to include Dinobots, Triple Changers, Insecticons, a combiner, and a very special last line of defense, among other offerings, giving children a seemingly infinite set of options to fill their ongoing wish lists. But for a 12-month annual cycle that found itself sandwiched between an iconic 1984 opening year and an ageless wonder of an animated film in 1986, it's a good idea to revisit this 1985 year and tell the tale of how it's as epic as the rest. With that, Let's have a look at this expanded lineup of Autobots and Decepticons, and how it continued the legacy of being more than meets the eye for a franchise that's as popular today as it was back then. So strap in for this Toy Connections Toy History, because this is the history of the Transformers in the year of 1985. It's undeniable. In 1984, the Transformers were a runaway hit on TV and in the toy aisles, which put a lot of pressure on Hasbro to keep delivering new and exciting robots to keep the battle for Cybertron fresh. And by the second year, Hasbro knew they were onto something. So having learned a lesson from Mattel, they made sure that characters like Optimus Prime and Megatron were still available well into 1985. With an increasing popularity, the cartoon received a mega-sized second season, spanning 49 episodes, up from 16 episodes in the prior year. And with regards to the toys, the 1984 cast were originally released without the now iconic heat-sensitive rub sign, but as other companies began to latch on to its success by releasing bootlegs and capitalizing on the transforming robot concept, Owner company Hasbro transitioned to selling its 1984 figures with these faction revealing rub signs and also made sure their entire cast of 1985 toys would feature this rub sign as well. All of this would serve to distinguish the Hasbro and Takara owned Transformers line from other would be similar toys. But longtime fans know a G1 Transformer when they see one. And in 1985, Hasbro delivered some of the most iconic Autobot and Decepticon toys of all time. And the legacy of those toys is still seen today by the ongoing and continual reinterpretation of these beloved characters. Between Hasbro, Takara, and the myriad of third-party companies, virtually every G1 Transformer has had multiple modern releases. We can start by looking at the cast of cars since they were the primary focus among the good guy ranks in the opening year. A few were simple recolors of the popular first year good guys such as Smokescreen that go up like a championship grand touring car and utilizing the famous Nissan Datsun model like Prowl and Blue Streak in the previous year. Smokescreen was known for emitting a thick, dark smoke from his tailpipe to live up to his namesake and cause confusion for the Decepticons on the battlefield. Red Alert continued the theme of emergency-style vehicles like Prowl and Ratchet in Year 1, though utilized the same tooling as Sideswipe instead. Something of a pessimist in the original Sundo animated cartoon, Red Alert was often paired with this other bot due to their matching alt-mode style and personalities. Namely, Inferno, 
a fire truck whose mold was introduced into the Transformers in this year, filling a much needed gap and function amongst the Autobot ranks. Of course, Hasbro doubled down on this figure mold by also releasing Grapple, the well-known Autobot architect in Cybertronian Mythos, whose vehicular mode was that of a crane truck with an extendable hook on the end. In the animated series, Grapple would often find himself paired up with Hoist, an Autobot that shared the same basic design as his mold mate, Trailbreaker. Both characters were based on the fourth-generation Toyota Hilux, but where Trailbreaker was a defensive specialist known for using a force field, Hoist was a maintenance specialist, so logically, his alt mode was a tow truck. And since we are pointing out some parallels and similarities between the first and second year of Autobots, this gorgeous Corvette changing character known as Trax displayed equal, if not more, vanity about his appearance than even Sunstreaker did. His sleek vehicular mode and cool looking pair of rocket launchers in robot mode meant that he could back up both his looks and fighting prowess. And then there's Skids, the often forgotten Honda City Turbo who got less screen time than his fellow car bots. He does err on the intellectual side though, being a data collector and researcher of sorts. Careful with his fragile weapons though if you either have him or plan to get him into your collection. And with five all new pocket portable characters to love, the Minibots came back in 1985 too. There was Beachcomber, the geologist who prefers brains over brawn, and was featured heavily in the memorable season 2 episode titled The Golden Lagoon. Cosmos, an unidentified flying object responsible for reconnaissance and communications missions, and was quite colorful in terms of sporting yellow, red, and green to boot. Warpath, whose wham, bam, pow, verbal nature speech pattern made him stand out in the cartoon, not to mention his durable tank mode. Sea Spray, with the underwater bubbly sounding voice that turned into a small hovercraft and also being an endearing character in the cartoon series. And who could forget Power Glide with his color commentary and larger than life personality? All delivered in a Bostonian accent that would make Mark Wahlberg swoon. No way, that's awesome! Based on the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt 2, Power Glide was one of just two airplanes to join the ranks of the Autobots that year. You could also find a group of mini spies packed in with the mini bots, and that includes the first year of mini bots that continued to be re released in 1985. These spies featured Autobot or Decepticon rub signs, much like their larger counterparts, and came in several vehicle styles that could be received in yellow, white, or blue color schemes. This particular 1985 year was also largely known for characters who transcended multiple years and continued to show up in the franchise for decades to come, such as Perceptor, a scientist who was another to prefer knowledge over brutality. Perceptor was among the household mode Transformers to be adopted from the new Microman MicroChange line, seeing as he could transform into an actual working microscope in his alternate mode. And similarly, to counter the ever-iconic Decepticon communications officer in Soundwave, the Autobots had their own similarly themed character in Blaster, who was also adopted from the MicroChange line and turned into a boombox. He was another with a natural radio DJ sounding voice, and his toy was taller than that of his Soundwave counterpart. Of note though, is Blaster's cassettes would not be released in either toy form nor shown in animated form until 1986. Consistent with the feature-laden traits of Transformers toys of the 1980s, Moldmate's Twin Twist and Top Spin were an interesting pair of Autobots collectively known as the Jumpstarters. These bots used a variation of the 1950s era pullback motor to literally kick their feet over their heads and jump up into a standing position. Despite having never appeared in the animated series, both Top Spin, the Assault Specialist, and Twin Twist, the Demolitions Expert, would become prominent members of the Wreckers, a danger-loving Autobot sub-team that first appeared in the UK run of the Transformers from Marvel Comics. And joining Top Spin and Twin Twist in the ever-so-toughest nails Wreckers sub-faction were Whirl, known for aerial assault, and Roadbuster, his counterpart for ground assault missions. Unfortunately, we wouldn't see either in cartoon form during the original animated run, seeing as these toys were rebranded from Takatoku toys rather than the Takara-owned 
Diaclone and Microman toy lines. Once Takatoku was obtained by Takara competitor Bandai, it made it virtually impossible to feature these two in a Transformers cartoon, seeing as that would provide free advertising for a competing toy company. However, that didn't quite put a stop from getting this gorgeous bot, known as Jetfire, into American toy markets. Yes, the original Takatoku design adopted by Bandai was a staple in Macross and Robotech's franchise lore, but a redesign in comic form as well as a redesign and renaming into Skyfire for television form allowed this fantastic character to still enter the hearts and minds of young children for media purposes. He is quite fragile and still has a ton of accessories, but you can learn more about Jetfire, Skyfire, and the corresponding transition from Macross to Transformers in my History of Jetfire video that I filmed back in 2022. Now while your mileage may vary as a collector, many will be quick to point out that the Dinobots were a fantastic standout and a timeless addition to the Autobot ranks. Adopted from the Diaclone Dinosaur Robo line, the cartoon introduced us to Grimlock, the leader, as well as Slag the Triceratops, and Sludge the Brontosaurus before adding the Stegosaurus Snarl and the Pteranodon Swoop shortly thereafter. And what kid doesn't like dinosaurs? With the addition of the Dinobots, the Autobots now had a sub-team of their own based around brute strength and muscle, traits that up until that point were primarily associated with the Decepticons. And while all five Dinobots would continue to sell well into current times in both modern style and masterpiece type releases, it's easily arguable that Grimlock is every bit a pop culture icon in the same manner as others such as Bumblebee, Starscream, or Soundwave. Another icon known for his brute strength and firepower was the Autobot's last line of defense, Omega Supreme. In terms of his function when he was back on Cybertron, Omega Supreme was one of the Guardian robots thus being among those designed to protect Cybertronian resources and assets. And as such, Omega was in charge of protecting Crystal City in the original Sunbow animated cartoon. Unlike the other Guardian robots though, Omega Supreme was sentient and had a spark of his own, thus being a unique Transformer much like the rest of his fellow Autobots. His train track and space station mode, complete with a rocket mode and motorized, battery-powered tank, make for a fun setup that could function as part of Autobot headquarters. In the cartoon, Omega spoke with a booming voice and was very stern as well as stoic in his demeanor. Another neat fact about Omega Supreme is that the original toy was a reuse of a previous non-Transformers branded robot called Mechabot 1 from the company Toybox. In the 1980s, mail-away figures were some of the most desirable exclusives of any toy brand, and the Transformers were no exception. And even though the Power Dashers were technically available in 1984, they are almost always associated with the mail-away craze of 1985. Like their Jumpstarter cousins, the Power Dashers also utilize a pullback motor, which is probably the most exciting thing about them considering their overly basic design and simplistic transformation sequence. Then there were the three Omnibots, namely Camshaft, Downshift, and Overdrive, who took on car modes representing the same era as the rest of the Autobot cars and could fit in well with the rest of the Autobot ranks. Like the Power Dashers, you would cut out robot points on the backs of the boxes or file cards and mail them in with a few dollars worth of cash, then wait around until a box came in the mail with your figure inside. Other Autobot-based mail-aways of this year was the Time Warrior Digital Watch as well as the cardboard-based Stars Command Center. And while that covers the discussion regarding the Autobots, what good is a band of heroes without some villains to go up against them? That's right, the Decepticons were well represented in this year as well. While he was among those to appear in the first year and in fact the first episode of the 1984 cartoon series, Shockwave didn't make his way into toy form until 1985. Serving as a high-ranking officer of Megatrons, Shockwave's character was one who calculated literally everything and based all those decisions on logic rather than emotion, a rare trait among Decepticons. Like Omega Supreme and others, this toy wasn't based on reusing Takara-owned Diaclone or Microman molds, but came from the company Toyco, originally branded as a robot called Astro Magnum, though gone was Astro Magnum's more neutral gray color and replaced with the Decepticon theme of purple to make him more representative 
of our villains. Now joining the ranks of the more well-known seekers of Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarp were the trio of Conehead Jets, Dirge, Ramjet, and Thrust. While their main jet bodies were largely based on the F-15 jets used the prior year, they did see some modifications, particularly in their wings, which were unique when compared to one another. This trio of Seeker jets did do a lot to flesh out the Decepticon ranks, and while I did say that they're not as well known as the three that came before them, Dirge, Ramjet, and Thrust did manage to at least survive and stay intact past the 1986 movie, which is more than I can say for the first year of Seekers. And assisting the Seeker Jets in the skies were two other unique villains, the Triple Changers known as Astro Train and Blitzwing. With the ability to transform from a steam locomotive to a space shuttle, Astro Train was often used as a battle wagon, transporting the Decepticons both onto and off the battlefield. Blitzwing, on the other hand, with his tank and jet modes, had a more direct role in the fight against the Autobots, giving them a run for their money both on land and in the air. The Insecticons made their way into toy form this year as well. You had the Cerebro Shell, Psychological Warfare, Wielding Specialist in Bombshell, as well as the Electronic Warmongering Shrapnel and the Spy slash Espionage Expert in Kickback. I know some people like to army build their Insecticons, but I like keeping them simply as a trio. And joining the Insecticons were the more flashy colored Deluxe Insecticons, namely Venom, as well as Ransack, Chop Shop, and Barrage. Like Whirl and Roadbuster, they never made it into animated form due to being Takatoku-owned products that eventually were acquired by Bandai. Nevertheless, they are an option if you want to add to your Insecticon ranks. Now I can't say we've saved the best for last, or maybe we can. Takara and Hasbro stepped it up a notch by releasing its first of many combiners. Six Constructicons, namely Scavenger, Mixmaster, Long Haul, Hook, Bone Crusher, and the Leader Scrapper. A mortal enemy of both Omega Supreme and the Dinobots, these six could merge to form the Mighty Devastator, and while he'd see multiple recolorings including the 1993 Generation 2 Yellow and Orange variants, this iconic assembly of construction-based equipment robots has stood the test of time and is the first combiner many think of in terms of Transformers history and lore. Well there you have it, that is your epic cast of Transformers for 1985. I know for some of you, it's been a nice walk down memory lane, but if you're just discovering the Transformers today, hopefully you're inspired to build out your own collection of vintage, or even vintage-inspired bots. Every toy line, including the Transformers, was filled with loads of color, a broad selection of characters as shown here, plus you had comics for your reading pleasure and cartoons to enjoy once you got home from school or woke up to on a Saturday morning to rush over to the television. It was a magical time to be alive, and this colossal year played a big part in making all of this possible. We'll point out briefly as well that there were some characters such as various combiners that appeared in the 1985 cartoon, though their toys wouldn't make it into stores until the following year. That, and some characters like Alpha Trion, Elita One, and several others would only see releases much later during more modern times. Now, if you have memories about your favorite Transformers in this year, be sure to share your thoughts in the comments section below. And even if you didn't get into Transformers until after this, we'd still like to hear your thoughts on what stood out for you here. Special thanks to the Patreon supporters and channel members whose names can be found in the description section of this video for their ongoing pledge into the Toy Connections YouTube channel. You can become a patron yourself at patreon.com slash toy connections to unlock exclusive content and other benefits, or click the join button next to my channel name to get access to exclusive badges and emojis for your use in the comments section of any Toy Connections YouTube video or live stream. Further thanks goes to West of the Fandom Power Podcast for his collaboration efforts in the development of this history video. You can subscribe to the Fandom Power Podcast by clicking on the link in the description section as well. And if you'd like to continue your Transformers toy history journey, I'm going to leave a playlist for you to click on right up here. Or if you'd like to see an altogether different toy history video, I'm going to leave another video right over here. And with that, let's transform and roll out into the next video. Thanks again, and take care.